this is history five, and we move from this pair of texts, from Franklin and Thucydides, to another pair of texts, Tacitus and St. Teresa of Avila. So the movement is backward in time from Benjamin Franklin back to St. Teresa. And this movement is forward in time from Thucydides to Tacitus. Let's start with Franklin and St. Teresa for just a moment, and then we'll come over to the, to the others. What we're doing here is we're taking autobiographies because autobiography is the way in which a person is able to navigate through history. And it's very difficult. It's extremely difficult to be an individual who navigates through history. One thing that you're doing is you're writing a history of the last two years, giving you a first-hand acquaintance with the whole process of what it is to do an autobiography, at least in part. For you, in doing your autobiography of the last two years, at this point of this education, you have an advantage. If you've been with this education all the way, this is the seventh of eight sections. So that you have, looking back from this particular history phase, you have history going back to art, going back to vision, which is three quarters, three phases of the differential year. And then you have the four phases of the whole integral year of symbols, myths, rituals, and nature. So that by doing an autobiography of the last two years at this juncture, you would effectively have a means of recalling your life in terms of the, of the course, of the phases of this course. Looking back, the phrase is retrospective recalibration. The last phase, science does not occur yet. It's in the future. And so for you, the beginnings of your history are the three months before you came into the course, before you began the education. And because it's delimited to a three-month period, it effectively takes the three-month phasing of the education, of the pattern of the course, and superimposes it upon your life before. So that the helter-skelter quality of your life before becomes codified, becomes encapsulated in a time form, the three-month time form, which allows for it to be factored into the seven phases of three months for your education experience. This is a way for the education at this juncture, at this time, to reach back and begin to recalibrate your entire life. Because if you can reach back with the sense of pacing and of structure that the education is sensitizing you to, you may not intellectually understand all of it. It takes a long time to do so. You may not remember a great deal of it. That takes practice also. But the knowledge and the memories are there. They're in effect. And if you bring them into process by active usage, they will clarify themselves. And that clarity will extend itself back to the life that you had before you came into the education. So that the whole process of writing your history of the last two years at this juncture is not just some kind of off-the-cuff assignment. 
but is a very poignant way of gelling the education, of gelling the rhythm of the education, of bringing the structure of the education into a sharp relief, into a detail. And not only does the education come into structure, into detail, by usage, by bringing it into play, but it gives you the first step in a very wide universe of going back and recalibrating your life. Uh, the phrase from Socrates, remembered for 2,400 years, is the unexamined life is not worth living. Why is the unexamined life not worth living? Because it is not realistic. An examined life becomes very realistic. And to the extent that it becomes more and more realistic, your interactions with other people becomes more realistic. Your decisions and your choices that you follow become more realistic so that your life begins to have a different quality. The life, the unexamined life, was at its best an excursion into myth. The unexamined life is very mythic. That is to say, the leading indication of what you're going to do, of what you like or don't like, is feeling, feeling tone. I'll do what I like. Yes, you'll do what you like. But myth has a very deep structural archetypal way of giving you models of choices. So you do what you like within a range of choices that are delivered to you largely by what Jung would call archetype. And also, it's not only that you're living within those stories. Those stories have developments which are characteristic. So characteristic are the plot lines of stories that the joke 30 years ago was that Hollywood movies could be classified according to 36 themes. And there were sub-variations, but there were 36 themes. And so professional writers getting together on Sunset Boulevard in the 1960s would talk to each other about doing a plot 13. <laughs> doing a C version of plot 13, we gotta turn it in. Goddamn studio, it's not gonna pay for a 14, not this year. Maybe next year we'll do a 14. Oh, you do a 13 this year, yeah. All right, well, let's go do that. Very standardized. I can remember in the early 1960s, in fact, I think it was 1960, I was the head porter at Sequoia National Park and I got to know all of the guests because I was only 19, I was fascinated by the variety of people and one of the guest was Joe Hines, who was the great genius behind Playhouse 90, which in the 50s had been one of the television powerhouses. And old Joe uh, was a chain smoker. He smoked Lucky Strikes. He used to cut the packs in half. And I'd say, Joe, uh, you know, what's going on here? Can't you afford cigarettes? He said, uh, he said, I have plenty of money. He said, I'm trying to get over the the damaging effect of cigarettes, and it's lighting up, that's the real addictive thing. So I cut the packs in half so I get 40 lights. He said, I'm down to uh, three packs a day, <laughs> which is 120 lights. And Joe Hines told me, he said, you know, he said, stories are very easy to write once you learn what the stories are. If you learn the types of the stories, then you just put, you drop characters into those stories, those stories write themselves. And all you have to do is let yourself be carried by the story type. And it will write it, it'll complete it, give you the vocabulary and everything. All of this is to say that myth is a story which includes you. You're in the story. And the story plays out best if you give yourself to that story. Let it play out. Whereas history is exactly diametrically the opposite of myth. 
Myth, you are in the story. In history, you're the storyteller. There are no plot lines that apply. You have to do something for something to happen. In myth, it's very easy once you get it. Once you get it, like the tribal people get it. You do the rituals that fit in with nature in the cycle that nature has, and those mythic storylines will play themselves out in a nice harmony with nature, and the rituals will be quite real, and everything will work beautifully. The only thing to watch out is that you don't think too much. Because the interiorization of language produces an inner world. It produces a mind, a mental interior world, which because, and we talked about this last year, because symbols do not have any direct connection with nature, they have to figure out a contact with nature through an intermediary. They have to figure out through myth or through ritual some intermediary contact with nature. And so the mind has to constantly be reminded to be natural because the mind naturally is not natural, but is a kind of a super integration which we call abstract. Minds left to themselves become more and more abstract. We say of somebody who's intellectual, they're an egghead. Well, at least 40 years ago, they used to talk about an egghead. What's an egghead? It means somebody who hasn't been born yet, right? Still in an egg. What hasn't been born? Of course, they're walking around, they're doing all this. It means that the world in which they could be realistic, they're still an egg. They haven't been born yet. What is born out of that egg? When that egg head hatches, what do you get? You get the beginnings of a differential consciousness, a completely different world scene, not a landscape of nature, and not at all limited to, to a landscape of stories whose patterns go back to instinctual structures, but you come to a landscape which is visionary, which is magical, which is more related to fairy tales or surrealism or science fiction than it is to nature. And because one has been hatched, one's been born out of the mind, out of the egghead, into a realm now which not only has time and space, but has consciousness, and into a realm where there's conscious time space, now everything is different. If you add a dimension, everything is different. If you take one dimension, one dimensionality, and you add a second dimension to it, it changes everything. It's the difference between a point and a line. If you add a third dimension, it changes even more radically. It's the difference between a point and a line and a plane. And if you add a fourth dimension, you get time. If you add a fifth dimension, like consciousness, and get conscious time space, everything is completely different. The way in which one can be realistic now is quite uh, changed, or even to use the Elizabethan English, changed to a wondrous glow. Because everything that you did before doesn't seem to work right. It's like a, a ship which has the old rudder, but the currents are so vast that uh, the rudder doesn't work anymore. So one has to learn a new way of sailing. One has to realize that you're no longer on the water, but you're in the air. And flying is quite different from sailing. This kind of equality comes to its apotheosis in the discovery that there's an art to conscious time space. And the art is called spiritual life. Spiritual life. It isn't just life. It isn't just natural life. And it isn't just mythic life, but it's now a conscious life. And a conscious life 
gains its form, gains its viability in the art of person making. One has to become an artist. But when you become an artist, that's not the end all. What, what's the sense of becoming an artist if you don't practice your art? So if you become a storyteller, it's the natural thing to begin telling stories. And because they're not guaranteed by some mythic insurance company, they're not underwritten by archetypal energy incorporated anymore, you have to find something to do. And the first time it occurs to you that you could be bored because you don't know what to do. Do you get it? And when you're bored, the whole process of the spiritual person goes back to the next objective rung for an answer. You ask your inner self, you ask your mind, what am I going to do? And your mind, if it's not really well educated, will give you an abstract answer that won't satisfy you at all. The mind will say something to you that the mind really appreciates, concentrate more. <laughs> and so you're bored and you concentrate more and you discover that in your concentration the boredom becomes anxiety. This is no good. This is not a good storyline. This will not sell. This is not plot 14 or even 13. It's not even on the 36 top plots. It's like nowhere. You don't want to be there at all. So what do you do? You look around to see, well, who's, who's, who has called a good game in the past? And the ego says, I've always called a good game. Huh. With, with my mythos, uh, you were okay. And now, you know, you left me aside to try and become uh, individual, to try and become humane, <laughs> develop sensitive relationships with people and things. Just get willful, get egotistical, and uh, we'll get you back in the driver's seat. <laughs> When you get the story that you want, and you get the role you want, uh, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll pay you the salary. Forget it. You don't have to deal with those people. You don't have to be sensitive to them. And so a regression sets in that sounds beautiful. And it seems so homey and so satisfying because, of course, we were like that. We were like that in our development. Not only in our development as individuals, in our adolescence, but the whole species was like that uh, many times for thousands and thousands of years. And so these stories are well told and one feels at home. And you don't want to deal with the wilds of consciousness. Because if you do choose to be a storyteller, what do you face? You face a five-dimensional minimum, five-dimensional continuum called history. And history is full of real problems. There are lots of bad guys out there. And worse girls. And worse guys. And even worse situations. And if you start trying to look ahead, because a differential process doesn't look back, it looks ahead. They phrase in Greek is uh, pronoia, looking ahead. And when you look ahead, because it hasn't happened yet, because it's a future, because it's an openness, it's an unknown, always it's very scary, especially when you have as an alternative the safety net of comfortable myths to live by. Well, who wouldn't want to uh, get back there? Someone who realizes that getting back there is a regression. And regressions have a very peculiar quality. They turn all of the nutritive getting facilities, like teeth, into shark's teeth. Shark's teeth are perfectly good as long as you're going in. It's when you try to come back out that they lacerate. And so all of the qualities of yourself 
that aid in making life nutritive become detrimental if you try to go against them then. And so regression can only go one way. You can't ever find a balance in regression. You have to keep going back. And if you keep regressing, where do you get to? You get to the body. You get to ritual. You get to sheer existence where everything is very practical, but it's only here. It's only what you can pound. And so regression stops there. But regression carries with it an energy and a dynamic which is detrimental. And when you get to the body, you don't get to the body in any natural way. You get to it going back and you carry all of those energies, all of that dynamic back to the body. The body can't deal with it. What's it going to do? And so you get all the things that the body does and has to have in order to survive with this barrage. This in itself is a characteristic myth. All of this in itself is one of the great mythic stories. And so one is tempted all the time to just fall into a kind of a defeated acceptance of this is the way things are. There's nothing I can do about it. Well, that's not true. Because the truth is, only you can do something about it. Out of all the possibilities in the universe, only you can. Because all of the helpers that there are, all of the demons that there are, exist on the mythic level. What exists there on the edge where you springboard off your spiritual individuality in conscious time space going into history, the phrase was nothing is written. It's completely open, but it's up to you to write it. And if you don't have the creativity if you don't have the resources, the background, you don't know what to write. You don't even have uh, the, the chance to make something interesting for yourself. So one of the purposes of this kind of education is to give you a look-see at the planet's heritage of wisdom, of excellence, so that you have, by the end of the education, exposure to uh, almost every single major civilization that the planet has had so far, including ones of the future, future possibilities. And in doing this history, one comes to understand that the history not only can calibrate the life which you have, but its calibration can creatively go back and recalibrate, transform those areas of your life, those years of your life, those decades of your life that you thought were past, that nothing more can be done with them. They're history. No, they're not. They're not statically dead. History is a process and not a stasis. They're not objectively carved in stone. They are a process eternally so that one can go back and you can change the mix of that process. You can rewrite your history. The spiritual individual is extremely potent, more potent than the myths. The myths can never be changed, but histories can always be changed, but only you can change your history. And so we're talking about freedom talking about freedom. Not freedom with little letters or even just with capital letters, but freedom like in wide open spaces. We're talking about not only freedom, but we're talking about joy. It's this quality. Because the extension does not only go back retrospectively so you can re 
calibrate your life the way you as a story writer want it to play out. You can emphasize elements that are different. You can emphasize situations. You can remember qualities that you forgot and bring them back into play, give them starring roles. And equally with going back and recapturing the past the way you want to, you can then do your future history the way that you would like to. So history is not just the past, but it's the future also. But not just the dead past, but the living past, as well as the living future. And so 5,000 years ago, when the phrase was first used, it was called, this continuum was called living time. That's what the Egyptians of the first dynasty, 3000 BC, called it, living time. It was symbolized by cobras that were arranged like figure eights but linked together so that the eights linked together on and on. If you took an abstract symbol of one of those figure eights and put it in the horizon, it would be an infinity sign. But when they're arranged vertically, like an accordion, of infinite cobras, that was the energy of living time which belongs to the divine realm. And that a human being who is pulled out of their life-death short circuit into the capacity to redo their history, because they now live in the realms of the Lord of history, they were able to access the eternity of living time. And this was called salvation. It was a totally different outlook. has nothing to do with doctrine. It leaves level of doctrine many orders below. It has nothing to do with myth. Nothing to do with myth. It leaves that many orders behind. It's not a function of the mind. The mind is left behind. Consciousness is so superior to what we would term the mind that there's no comparison whatsoever. The best that a mind can do is to quiet itself to absolute zero, to condense everything to one-pointedness. That's the most that a mind can do. You've seen, for instance, there are some um, sculptures in Buddhism where the meditator is holding hands like this. What's in those hands? The mind. We just put it right there and just leave it there. Because the excursion that's happening, the exploration that's happening, is a universal differentiality which transcends. What does it transcend? It transcends the natural integrative cycle completely, which includes the mind. The mind is like the center of the integrative cycle. And it is. It is that. But it is precisely in exactly that, no more. Whereas the reverberations of consciousness are a vibration of freedom. This is why it's so important for teachers of health of civilizations and of spiritual beings to remind you that freedom is not a desiderata of political program it's an absolute structural requirement of reality. That's what we're talking about. That our freedom, individually and together, is a necessity for reality to happen. And to the extent that it doesn't happen, reality is crimped and impaired and not allowed to be. This is why cooperation on a conscientious level where someone is working with spiritual, centered, time, conscious time space, everyone's freedom is an issue to yourself. Because the more beings who are real in this openness, the more actual the exploration becomes of creating an open cosmos. Heaven is made by the cooperation of spiritual beings working together in their freedom. 
That's how it works. That's how it happens. You don't need any aliens to tell you this. You don't need any super yogis to tell you this. Not anymore. Both those options are, by our time, mythic. The super yogis are as mythic as Bugs Bunny. The gurus which can give you grace are not much more than Porky Pig. <laughs> I'm using a kind of a Hollywood juxtaposition to get you off the hook so that you can let those things just rest. You can go back and get them if you really need them. Try it. Set them down. One of the great cycles in mythic vectors is the cycle of realization. And one of the very best presentations of that kind of a cycle are the seven voyages of Sinbad and the Arabian Nights. And at one point, Sinbad is captured by an old man who has seemed like he's like this Sufi guru who's going to really help Sinbad and he's going to help direct Sinbad to all of the magical, beautiful treasures of life. If Sinbad will just carry this old man into town, he'll begin training him. And so he puts the old man on his back and the old man wraps his gnarled legs around and gets a chokehold on Sinbad. So that you can't let him go. You have to carry him, and you carry him where he wants to go, not where you want to go. You become a beast of burden. You become the public relations mule for the guru. You go where they want to go, and you're imprisoned in the mythology that you had a taste for, and that's why you got addicted to it in the first place. And in the Arabian Nights, Shahrazad being wild magus of the conscious time-space realms of freedom, Shahrazad says in the very next night after she's allowed to live one more night because the sultan says, I, I can't kill her, I've got to find out what happens. She does this for a thousand nights in a row. That's how she survived until finally he learns to appreciate her. How does Sinbad get out of that? He trains himself to be infinitely attentive so that the slightest change in the pressure of the old man's legs locked around him will give him the split second to flip him off and get free so that one learns to concentrate and be more attentive than the demons or the gurus who are leading you around in their myths. One becomes like a gunfighter for your own freedom. And sure enough, because the resistances, because the mythic levels, even of the super guru myths, are always limited. They're not perfect. They're not perfectly sealed. If they were perfect, they would be one-pointedness, and they would not do this. They do this because they're still playing out the stories, and storylines always have moments where they sag. So you wait for, attentively wait for the bad moment of dialogue, for the clumsy execution of a movement. That's why when you get to be a director and a good critic of what's happening, of the dramatic action of one's life, you see that the governor of this is not a very good actor, not a complete director, and at an opportune moment, that's it. Throw them off. And don't be a sucker to idiot compassion that, oh, you should go back and pick them up again. Bye. This quality is there in the autobiographies of St. Teresa and Benjamin Franklin. It's a quality, it's one of the hands, of two hands, which we need for history. Autobiography on one hand and histories on the other. 
The other hand are the large patterns that intelligent men and women have noticed that when they bring their spiritual conscious time space into play, into this process of history, there are certain developments which have also a kind of a structural savvy to them. They're not like myths. They don't play themselves out exactly because they're not integral. They're differential, so they play themselves out differently. So one has to know a range of possibilities all the time. And instead of keeping tabs of a structure which reads out like this, you keep tabs of a ratioing proportion that has certain possibilities. And within that differential gestalt, one chooses to navigate in ways which open it up more. The way to navigate in consciousness is not to choose goals. Goal choosing is a ready-made regressive habituation. You pay a lot of money, you waste a lot of lives by getting goal-oriented. The people who win the goal-oriented game are the people who set up the goals. And they become fewer and fewer as they become more and more successful. That's the whole purpose of Tacitus writing his history of Rome. Goal setting universes are owned by the Roman Empire. <laughs> They're ruled by the oligarchies, which means the rule of the few. There's a beautiful line in a World War II movie where Richard Burton in a bar ruminates and he says, one thing about being one of the few is that you get fewer. <laughs> right. And the whole purpose of an oligarchy, as Tacitus points out, is insidious. And so one has to learn to not do this goal-oriented, but rather to look for the possibilities that add to openness and possibility. Possibilities that have more possibilities. One has to look with a differential open-eyedness. So when you look back and you see a religious figure from ancient Samaria, from five, six, thousand years ago, you see someone whose toga has the pattern of exfoliate flowers on it, quaternary flowers that are opened. And you look at the faces of these figures, and they're characterized by owl eyes, great big huge eyes, eyes where the pupil fills the whole eye space, and the pupil is half the size of the head. They are seers, seers. They are wise people who do not see goals, they see seeing. And so a differential consciousness sees seeing and not goals. They don't set up inculcated doctrines to get to specified goals. They engender the melodies of the hymns of freedom so that the proportions of openness continue to open. This is a difference. This is an education which makes civilizations that create a heaven where the stars sing together, where out there is not populated by super intelligent demons who are in out to do you in, in ways that you never suspected. That kind of a universe is totally fictive, regressive, mythologically addicted crap. Did I get that? I think I read the cereal box right. Those are the ingredients that are there. Different from that is a universe which is indeed heavenly, which is out there, actually, ready to be what it will be when we, exploring it in freedom, make it so. 
whatever we do, that's what will be there. That's a great deal of difference. One of the last men on the moon, Jim Irwin, had a dream on the moon. He dreamed he was with his pal in the lunar rover, and they were driving out of sight of the LEM lunar module, lunar excursion module. They drove out of sight of the LEM over the lunar rolling hills. And in the dream, they had gotten very far from base camp. And they saw something coming over a rise in the distance. And Irwin got very curious, so he steered the rover in his dream towards it. And he saw that it was another rover coming their way. And the two rovers met. And Irwin said he looked, and the occupants were themselves. <laughs> who had driven in out of the wilds of the unexplored moon and met on the liminal range at the very end of the rover's capacity to explore. Its physiological energy wouldn't carry it any further. And so at the end of the bubble of the possible, Irwin met himself coming in out of the future unknowns. Irwin died without ever having a chance to go back and explore that moon. No one has gone back and explored that moon. That moon is there waiting exactly where it was left, because that's the way history is. It is left exactly at that degree of exploration. And it's not going to move one inch on its own, because there's no myth for it. It's only when men and women go back and retrace that history and get to that verge where they can write it any way they want from there on out. And it isn't just that the moon has a huge landscape. There's more land on the moon than there is on Earth. The oceans of the Earth take up most of the Earth. The moon, small as it seemingly is, has more land mass than the Earth. And beyond that, our world's without end. One galaxy in Virgo was identified as having a hundred trillion stars. That's just one. So there's plenty of land to explore. There's plenty of adventures. Freedom means more exponential numbers than you could conceive of possibilities. So when the Hollywood writers on Sunset Boulevard in 1997 say all the science fiction themes have been done, don't buy them a drink. <laughs> Break. The language of Tacitus is a colossal style. It's famous. It's famous for this blunt, elegant, uh, plunging, depth of meaning. Tacitus was, um, he was born in 55 AD and lived into like maybe around 120 AD. So he was born into the Roman Empire that had become crazy, absolutely psychotic. And he lived to see it temporarily pulled out by a professional warrior named uh, Trajan. Trajan was like the Roman Eisenhower. He was just extremely capable, and he just he pulled the, the Roman Empire out of its psychotic nosedive. And for about a century or so, it became what it had been planned to be, a stable power oligarchy that controlled the world. And from the time of Augustus Caesar to Trajan, was a complete psychotic century in which Tacitus lived. And not only lived, but he, but he did very well. He was extremely intelligent. He married the daughter of the Roman governor of Britain, Agricola. And one of his first little books was a biography of Agricola. And then he wrote a little biography of Germanicus. 
And then he realized that he had a front row seat on colossal world scale madness. So he began writing the histories and Tacitus's histories take the Roman world from 69 AD. In the year 69, there were four separate emperors in the same year. I mean, the empire just went like a soccer game from one person to another. And he took it all the way through to 96 AD, which was the uh, year that the reign of the uh, Roman emperor named Domitian was called the terror in world history. The terror of Domitian ended, and Trajan came in and just simply changed everything. And so Tacitus's history is about this colossal period from 69 to 96 AD when a new kind of emperor came in, a completely new family, not the Caesars, but the Flavians. Vespasian was the first of the Flavian emperors, and then his two sons, Titus and Domitian, came in, and the three together formed a dynasty called the Flavian dynasty. And they were psychotic, but they were so smooth about it that they carried the psychosis for, well, what is it, 27 years. Vespasian was a soldier who was convinced that he was the Messiah, that all of the Jewish Hellenistic prophecies applied to him, and that he was like a world healer, and like he was in Alexandria, Egypt, when the people trying to get in good with the power structure said, you know, the hottest thing is this Messiah thing. You've got to get into this. And uh, you've, got to, you've got to have some healing stories. And so Vespasian went through the whole thing where he healed the blind and the lame. All of the miracle stories that are ascribed to Jesus were ascribed to Flav uh, the Flavian founder, Vespasian. And uh, he like would take uh, uh, soil and moisten it with his own spit, put it on blind people, and they would wash it off, and the guy could see. So he figured that he was the Messiah of the New Age. And the reason that the Romans, on the level of emperors, believed in all this is because the greatest Roman epic poet, Virgil, had predicted the birth of a Messiah of a new golden age in one of his poems, which is called the Fourth Echologue. Uh, echologues are, are, are short, fairly short poems. They're about a page or two pages, three pages. And the fourth of those is called the Messianic Echologue of Virgil. Virgil died in 19 BC, so it was like, you know, generation before any of this stuff came to happen. And he predicted on the basis of Roman astrology that the cycle of the stars had come full circle back to the beginning of a new golden age and that there would be a central star that would signal who that messianic person would be. And Vespasian claimed that it was him. And because he was the Messiah in kind of a, a Leninist, Stalinist sort of way, he's the one who ordered the destruction of Jerusalem so there would be no more competition. No more Jewish messiahs because there would be no more Jewish power at all. So it was Vespasian's son Titus who was in charge of the siege of, and destruction of Jerusalem. And it was Titus who pursued the rebels all the way to Masada because they were the religious rebels who were waiting for the Messiah. They didn't believe in Jesus and they didn't believe in Vespasian. And so that's why the pursuit, the Roman power pursuit all the way to Masada was to wipe out the Essene apocalyptic segment of Judaism, to kill them all. So there would be no competition with the Flavian dynasty who had ruled came to rule the Roman Empire. And it was uh, Vespasian's son, Titus, who took the great menorah from the temple in Jerusalem, took it to Rome in this triumphal procession. He marched into Rome, and the very first thing 
behind him was the great, huge uh, menorah, candlestick from the temple. And to commemorate it, the, when they built the Arch of Titus, which was the entrance to the Roman Forum, they put the uh, menorah right in the center where the key would be, the keystone to hold the arch together. And the Arch of Titus has survived for 2,000 years. It's still there in Rome. You can go and you can stand there on those stones and you can look at that Arch of Titus and see that menorah where the keystone is. That was the center of Messianic Roman uh, power in the Flavian dynasty. Well, Vespasian, because he was like the one who, who received all this uh, visionary acclaim, he could somewhat carry it. And his son Titus, because he had been the victorious commander, he could carry the energy somewhat. But when Domitian, the younger son, became emperor, it just went imploded into him and became super suspicious that maybe there was some messianic underground somewhere. And so Domitian's reign was increasingly to find out, to ferret out who were the possible apocalyptic carriers of a competitive messianic flavor. And of course, Domitian's reign is famous because he finally found the number one person in the world, a Jew, who was St. John, who was brought to Rome in front of Domitian. And Domitian was super superstitious about St. John because St. John in his old age carried a tremendous charisma. An possibly great charisma. And Domitian realized that if he killed him, that this would just be an apocalyptic trigger that who knows what it would set off. So he decided not to kill him. Not going to kill you, but I'm going to isolate you permanently. And so he isolated him to an island called Patmos off the Turkish coast. And he was left there on that little rocky island to just die out. Curious thing about Patmos, it's shaped like a rock ship in the Aegean that faces in towards shore. And if you're on one end of it, it's almost like being on the poop deck of a ship that's there. And that's where St. John wrote the Apocalypse on Patmos to show up the Roman Empire that they indeed did not have the messianic energy, that he carried it and that he bestowed it upon the world in writing the book of Revelation. So all this is fantastic, amazing history. And Tacitus is the one who wrote the story better than anyone did, except that the chapters dealing with Jewish messianic stuff have conveniently been lost. When you look at the stories, you find that the histories end midstream and that there just is uh, no way that, that the story goes on. Because when he finished the histories, Tacitus realized that underlying this psychotic madness of the Flavians was a very profound archetypal madness of the Caesars. So he wrote a sequel to the histories, which was a prequel. He wrote a book after the histories, which was the history before, of the Caesars. And so the annals of Tacitus is the years from the death of Augustus Caesar in 14 AD to the madness of Nero when he burnt the city of Rome in 68 AD. 68, 69 AD. Now you have to understand that there's something, there's something so magnetically, chaotically mad, apocalyptic about this is that Nero burnt Rome within a year of when Titus burnt Jerusalem. Both cities, Rome and Jerusalem, were burnt to the ground because of the same apocalyptic messianic matrix. So that the Roman Empire 
is intimately tied up with Hellenistic Judaism and early apocalyptic Christianity. Intimately. And their final solution, you remember the phrase from, from another political group, the final solution was to assimilate the vision of what had become Christianity into the Roman Empire. And that's why it's called today the Holy Roman Catholic Church. That's why it's called that. They're still in business. <laughs> big time, big time. What did James Dean say? Not for long. The annals are missing the sections that deal with Tacitus describing the interworkings of the Jewish apocalyptic messianic movement on the Roman psyche at levels of the oligarchy, the power group that were running the world, and the emperor who was supposed to be the top of the oligarchy, the power group. Those sections are missing. All the rest of Tacitus is there. And of course, he was preserved because Tacitus was a major figure. Like Thucydides, he was a major figure. Thucydides was a general in the Peloponnesian War. His memoirs are the memoirs of like somebody who was like an Eisenhower or a Patton. Thucydides is more like a Patton. Tacitus is more like an Eisenhower. He became not only a, a, a one of the, the heads of the, of the Roman oligarchy, a senator and everything, but he became in 97 AD under Trajan, he became one of the two consuls for the Roman Empire. That is the head generals, there were always two head generals. And then he became proconsul, he became governor of Western Asia, of what is today is Turkey and uh, Palestine. So Tacitus became the head man, the head power figure under Trajan in that realm of the world um, from Ephesus to Jerusalem. So he knew what he was talking about. But Tacitus, in writing the histories, had tightened his language because he was dealing with such a profound psychotic pattern. What was psychotic about it is that it kept bouncing back regressively into mythic types that were not Roman so that they found themselves living out patterns that were Jewish and not Roman. But they didn't recognize it at first because the Jewish, the Hellenistic Jews, were quite different from rabbinic Judaism, which even with its branches of reform or whatever, orthodox, whatever, are radically different from what Hellenistic Judaism was. Hellenistic Judaism was like a universal religion. The only thing close to it is like the heyday of Mahayana Buddhism. Hellenistic Judaism was privy to a whole range of philosophies and outlooks and excellence, and one of the most viable of them was a Pythagorean mysticism. And that Pythagorean mysticism was the core of Plato's philosophy and technique. And Platonism in this time period of the Roman Empire, it's called Middle Platonism, had a great resurgence. In fact, there was not only a resurgence so that there was a Neoplatonism, but there was a resurgence so that there was a Neopythagoreanism. And Hellenistic Judaism of the first century AD was the universal presentor on a civilized scale of Neo-Pythagorean, Neo-Platonic religious insight. It was a vision which the Roman emperors and oligarchy also saw was the most viable vision. But when you deal with a vision in a regressive way, you fall into the basement mythologies that are subconsciously there underneath the surface of the vision. So early Christianity had the vision. Hellenistic Judaism had the vision. But the Roman oligarchy fell into the myths 
that were related to it but couldn't get to the vision. So they kept having to discover what they were doing and they were living out these myths and so they did what a regressive power group will always do. They thought that if they controlled the rituals, because the rituals are the foundation of the myths, if you control the rituals, then you can control the way in which the myths play out. Well, that's fine in a natural sense. If you control the rituals, then the myths will play out. But if you're coming regressively through, the myths are no longer structured by the rituals, but they're structured by the symbols. They're structured by the symbolic objectivity level and not the ritual objectivity level. So the Romans, like good, regressive, power-hungry oligarchs, thought if we reduce everything down to Roman law so that all the rituals are covered and people only can do this, then we will have secured for us boundaries for the mythic stories that we find that we're living out regardless of what we do. And it wasn't until the time of Hegel that people figured out that the myths are being played out regressively so that what structures them are not rituals of the state, but symbols of the ideology. And so philosophies of history became sensitive to, well, what the hell are the ideologies? And that's why when you take Hegel regressively, you get Marxist-Leninism. And another version of it is National Socialism. If, and they're like attempts, again, regressively, but on the other hand, instead of controlling people through standardizing the rituals, you control people by standardizing the ideologies. You make them think the symbols, and that will structure so that there'll be limitations to the myths that people are having to live out regardless of what you're doing, and this way you get a kind of surreptitious control over history and over people and over power. Understand? All of that, all of that is a delusion. All of that is a delusion. All of the lives lived pro or con or in spite of, as long as they're oriented, towards that kind of a struggle and structure are delusory lives. They're not really real. That is to say, there's no trace in the universe whatsoever of those actions. They don't register. There are actions which register in the cosmos the star systems actually adjust, however minutely, to real actions. The observer influences what's being observed in the experiment. However minutely, it still registers. But an illusion and a delusion, the difference is an illusion is what you perceive, and a delusion is what you believe on the basis of what you illusorily say. Actions in delusion do not register in reality at all. So they leave no trace. This is why somebody going into a deep realization discovers how uh, the best way to say it is the way in which Aldous Huxley's uh, Parisian psychiatrist, Hubert Benoit, said, one tracks down a problem to its ultimate structure and discovers that the problem, the real problem, is that there was no problem in the first place. It's called nil awakening. You realize that the problem was that there was no problem in the first place. So that the seeking for an answer was as psychotic as thinking that there was a problem. So the whole thing of goal-oriented ritual action is a complete delusion. 
It has nothing to do. And people who teach it better get into class and start learning. Because the doctors of civilization are going to start healing. Because we've had enough of this. I think the word is crap. Tacitus is one of the great figures in this whole development of the sense of increasing sensitivity to history so that one can begin to tell when reality is obtaining or whether delusion is ruling. And Tacitus uses this incredible language, this blunt, elegant, plunging language in order to prepare the reader to stop talking foolishness, to stop gibbering in some kind of neurotic confessional spiel, and to start realizing consciously that what you say is helping structure what is really happening. Because a magic language changes nature. It transforms nature. And you have to learn to say what you mean and use that language with great advisability and sensitivity because what you're saying is structuring actually what is really going to occur and the way it's going to occur. It's as simple as saying that when God creates, he speaks it. <laughs> Let there be light. And there was light. Do you get it? It's very simple once you understand. Now, an education that doesn't prepare you to understand in this level is a waste of time. It's a waste of money. It inculcates a propensity to stay in delusion. So uh, there is such a thing as waking up. But you need a process it's like a process in nature. A polluted stream will purify itself after about two or three miles of running over bedrock. But you have to get into a process that does that long enough to purify so that then you get back to basics. So that you can look up and look around and you can see, you can hear, you can taste what is naturally really there and from there build up to a maturity of spiritual consciousness again. But it takes a while to do that because we're all larded up with not only the delusions that are inculcated by shoddy, if not fictitious, false education, but by a so-called culture embedded in a so-called civilization that are themselves products of thousands of years of delusion. Now, if you diagram this to someone who is limited to an integral cycle of realization, they would conclude, and rightly so, that it's an impossible situation to get out of. It's a situation characterized by Descartes in the 17th century. If God is an evil genius, he is so good at deceiving us, we will never know. But fortunately, one is not limited by the integral cycle. The differential cycle works on infinite possibility, on proportions that are creative. And even if there were some kind of ultimate evil genius, the ultimate evil genius would not have a capacity to, to take care of possibilities not yet met in dimensions never before encountered. And that's where uh, there's a great difference. Now, Tacitus, in doing the annals, following up the histories and making a basis for it, looks at, at the beginning. His beginning is the day that Augustus Caesar died. The day of the death of Augustus Caesar was a profound event for one thing, Augustus Caesar had ruled the world for 44 years. He had been the top dog in power plays and triumphants and so forth 
for many years before that. So ostensibly for more than half a century, for two thirds of a century, he was the arbiter of the way in which the world was characterized. So that there were very few people alive who had ever lived in a world not dictated by Augustus. Now Augustus Caesar is only the tip of the iceberg. He's the head honcho who got to play out the power role, but the power role was not made by him. He fit it. The man who played out the creation of the power role was his uncle, Julius Caesar. And it's Julius Caesar who was the first Roman to be divinized. It's called Divine Julius, the apotheosis of the man. He's the one who changed the structure of the temporary dictator who became dictator for life. And Tacitus goes in to this right away at the very beginning of the annals. He writes in translation, in Rome's earliest years as a city, its rulers were kings. Then Lucius Junius Brutus created the consulate and free republican institutions in general. Dictatorships were assumed only in emergencies. The regime of the Council of Ten did not last more than two years, and then there was a short-lived arrangement by which senior army officers, the commanders of tribal contingents, had councilor authority. And then he goes on from there. Now, all of this had happened when did Rome get founded uh, by the kings? Rome was founded around 750 BC. Romulus and Remus. But it was Numa Pompilius who was the one that set the first tone of a structure whereby the kingship of ancient Rome had a republican kind of a quality to it. Numa is the one who set up the sense that the Roman people as a people form a gestalt which is whole only when they are actively involved. Now they can be involved actively through their leaders, through their representatives. And the Roman sense in ancient times was always by uh, the rule of ten. For every 10 people, there was someone who spoke. And for every 10, 10, there was somebody who spoke and on up. So that Numa was a king who transformed the ancient Roman sense that all of the people as a form were actively a part of the Gestalt and thus it was real. As long as all the representatives on all the hierarchical letter, levels came together and at the center, the king was the center of the structure. He was not the one who ruled. He's the one who held together the gestalt of the people. So the king was the center of the people in that sense. And so Roman republicanism was related to ancient kingship. The idea that the king was the center of the people, but that through the wheel of the people as a whole, the Roman emperor as a center had an axis, a celestial axis, that came into his person. And the other end of that celestial axis that came on one end to his person, the other end came into the very center of heaven, into the pole star. And all the other constellations that go around the pole star constitute the gestalt of heaven. So that these two wheels are held together by a single axis so that the earthly king had a divine quality in that he participated on one end of this axis that went into the celestial pole. And this was the whole basis then of the Roman Republic and the Roman kingship. And all of that lasted down to the time of Julius Caesar. There was always a sense in the Roman people 
for over 700 years that there was something, the uh, Latin word was gravitas. It meant that there was a gravity to the individual person because they counted in what was real about the world. The Italian tribes were real in their relationship to each other in this large gestalt, and the center of that gestalt was the city of Rome, and the center of that was the king. And to understand that, to be able to have that structure in one's sensitivity, in one's estimation of what was going on, was the essence of the Roman Republic. And the last figure to understand that completely and respect it was Cicero. And Cicero was the spokesperson for the integrity of seven centuries of Roman plain respect for the individuals who make up the building blocks of the gestalt that makes Rome work and ties it to the way in which heaven works. Now if you usurp the Roman Republic and you make it a Roman Empire, you have to worry about the counterbalance in heaven. You have to make sure that the center of access also gets changed so that the structure of heaven must be changed to fit so that there must be a celestial empire that links up to the Roman Empire. And that's where you get the pre prescriptive universal dogmatic doctrines of a state religion. Do you get it? It's a structural necessity. You have to cover your bases. If you change the one, you have to change the other two. And it means that you have to make sure that the axis is working, that people believe in that structure and this structure and that the oligarchy controls the centering of both. Julius Caesar is the first person in Roman history to say that he was not only the permanent dictator of the Roman people, but he was the head of Roman religion, the Pontifex Maximus, so that he and himself had both ends of the axis. Augustus was very wise. He was what we used to call a slippery customer. He realized that it was going to be difficult for him to be the focus of this power unless he made it clear to them that he was the focus because it, he was the choice of the people, of all the people. And so he said of himself that he was not the ruler so much as that he was the first man, the principal man of the empire. And thus the correct name is not that it's the Roman Empire so much, but that, that it's the Augustan Principate. They call it the Principate. That the man at the center was the prince. The principal. <laughs> Number one. That everyone else counts, but before you ask anyone else, you ask him first. And if you know how power works, when you ask that first man, and he says this, you don't want to say too much of that. You want to say, well, this sounds good. Oh, I like that. And then things work. So that 1,500 years after Augustus, a very wise Italian genius named Machiavelli, when he wanted to let people know what power was in its structures, he wrote a book called The Prince which when you read Machiavelli, you get it that he still understood exactly what Augustus had meant. Reading the Prince is like a guide book. It's a textbook for the couriers of power. You want to stay in power with who's running the show? This is how it works. This is what you do. This is how you see. This is how you believe. This is what you tell your friends in private moments in your own homes that you understand. And as long as you do that, everything works. Tacitus had a front row seat 
and understood that something completely psychotic had happened and that it had happened on a worldwide scale. It wasn't just that there were bad individuals, it was that something radical had happened in the structure of the world as a reality that involved the structure of heaven as a reality. Now, the only way to get any kind of a realistic grip on it was to explore the process of history because it was in whether history could be explored or not was the key, the trigger, whether there was a regression begun or not. And so Tacitus's histories are a, a huge step in civilization beyond Thucydides. Thucydides takes the first great step in making sure that people reading his history would understand he is writing this because, given what human nature is, all of this will happen again and again. Tacitus is the example that 500 years later, not only will the same thing happen again and again, but there are those people who are invested in the regression who don't want you to tell others. And they take you out. When you're small, they just leave. But when you're effective, they take you out with no compunctions whatsoever. So Tacitus and Thucydides line up. They're like 500 years apart. Tacitus was famous for being the classical locus, that is the place in classical literature, where he talked about the cycle of the phoenix. The cycle of the phoenix is a historical cycle. It means that every 500 years, there's a season, there's a quarter of an aeon. An aeon is four cycles of the phoenix, four times five, 2,000 years, a double millennium, which is a time form. Just like space has forms and limitations, time, related to space, also has forms and limitations. That whatever is done in time-space has a time limit. It has a space limit. The boundary of the space is like the defining terrain. It's the geographical boundary of it. The time boundary are time forms. And the largest time form in the classical world was the aeon, the double millennium. But the form of the 500 years, the cycle of the phoenix, was the working operative form that most people worked with. 2,000 years is a little bit too much, unless, like our generation, you live at the end of one. Then it has to be taken into consideration. Tacitus, in writing his history, was saying, we have survived not only the emergence of a new cycle of the phoenix, but a completely new double millennium. That it already has happened, but what we are suffering from is this shaking, tremendous vibration through the restructuring, not only of the earth, but of heaven itself. Why are all these apocalyptic visions? Because heaven has been restructured. To force it, a war in heaven, to force it to match the restructuring of the earth. The founding of the Augustan Principate, the Roman Empire, has forced some kind of cosmic form, which is forcing a delusion upon those celestial realms. And so Tacitus is very serious about all this. He says, we face incredible problems. Because we not only have a psychotic earth, we now have a psychotic heaven as well. What are we going to do? And so his annals and his histories together trace the first century AD, the first century 
of the common era to show that what had happened was so psychotically titanic. And when the Caesar line played out, the Flavian line came in, and they added a whole other level, so that you have this parfait of evil building up. And that the piece of Trajan is a false crust imposed upon that, and that at some time in the future that will simply break because of volcanic pressures, not only go below the surface, they go to the structure below the below the surface. And they're tied up with heaven also. So that the earth and heaven are both under this apocalyptic mutual pressure. And that the hot seat in the Caesar times was the emperor. And that's why after Augustus, who handled the power, because he was like almost brought up from birth by Julius Caesar, his uncle made sure that Augustus understood that it's not you who are doing this. You're just, you're, you're the focus of all these divine powers. You're in my family. Julius Caesar used to point out to Augustus that he had a birthmark on his belly. And the birthmark was a series of marks arranged exactly in the pattern of the Big Dipper of Ursus Major, the seven stars. And that he was divine by designation. And when the Big Dipper rotates around the pole star, it makes the swastika of wholeness. So you, you are, you are the wholeness of uh, mankind in the universe. You don't have to work for it. But Augustus Caesar did not leave a relative or a son when he died in charge of the Roman Empire. He left an adopted son, an adopted son who was already middle-aged, Tiberius. And Tiberius Caesar was not in the blood lineage of Julius Caesar at all. He was not related by blood to Augustus Caesar. That's why Tiberius Caesar was psychotically interested in astrology because he couldn't count on the blood pattern carrying him. He had to find out what do the stars say? What do the astrological patterns say? And so he became ultimately superstitious. He used to test his personal astrologers by taking them out to one of his villas that was perched up uh, on uh, the Campania shores south of Rome, perched up on a mountain, and he would take them out there to kill them. And he would have them do a horoscope. And if they didn't predict by the horoscope of the moment that they were about to be killed, then they were killed. Do you see the madness in it? He was the ruler of the world until 36 AD, for 22 years. He was the principate. And after him, things just became worse, much worse, quickly. When Caligula came in, and Caligula's reign is missing from Tacitus's annals, because Caligula was convinced that it wasn't in the stars, and it wasn't among people. You could handle the people. You could get magicians or priests to handle the stars. But what you couldn't handle was this axis of power between the two of them, and that somehow the people who controlled the understanding of that axis were the Jews, especially the Jews in Alexandria. And so it was Caligula who became focused in his psychosis against the Hellenistic Jews in Alexandria. And it was in regard to his intolerable pogrom it was the first time the Jews were ever herded into stadiums and dispossessed of all their things and killed if they were protesting. It began with Caligula. So the Hellenistic Jews sent a delegation of five men headed by Philo of Alexandria to go meet with Caligula in Rome to try and wake him up enough so that he would not get caught into the psychosis so much as to kill them all off. And they were successful enough 
to at least stop uh, the fearful um, murder. And then Caligula was finally killed by the oligarchy around him. And a new emperor was brought in, Claudius. And the Alexandrian Jews made sure that Claudius understood that it was far more in his interest to keep this viable population on his side, helping him rather than murdering them all. And as long as Claudius was alive, this kind of uneasy peace was kept. But when the following emperor, Nero, came in, he saw that the conditions had changed, that it wasn't the Jews so much, but what the Jews had become, the Christians, they were at blame. And that's how history glacially slides into unbelievable madness. Tacitus is the most trustworthy historian of all these events. And he writes it from the inside from someone who has a front row seat on the oligarchy in Rome all this time. Go get your copies, read, and remember that the balance to it is St. Teresa of Avila, a mystical woman who's an exact contemporary of Cortez. There's a lot of structure here. It's taken me a lifetime to put this out. Don't throw it away, you have an opportunity. You don't have to go other places for a little while. Do this. Get combed out. Then you can go wherever you want to with deep breaths. More next week.